Okay, so got a special video for you today. I'm joined by a good friend, Charlie Morgan, who many of you may already know from the social media marketing space online. He's got a YouTube channel. I'll put a link in the description so you can check that out. But Charlie is someone who I stumbled across, I'd say it like just less than six months ago. And 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 in this midst of kind of loads of new creators coming into YouTube and all this new extra value, I was like, okay, let me see who who's actually kind of putting out the really good shit. Who's got the who's got who's got the really valuable stuff right who's now? Got the sauce. <laughs> <laughs> who's got the juice? And and I stumbled across Charlie and I watched a couple of his videos. I'm like, man, this guy really knows what he's talking about. And he's built an incredibly successful agency. And I value everything that he's saying. And I really want to connect with this guy and, and get him on here. And we've we've had a lot of chats over the last couple of months, been picking each other's brains, a ton of stuff, some little private mastermind. And I wanted to get Charlie on this channel to share his story with you guys. And I also want to pick his brain on some of the systems that he's implementing uh, at the moment as well. So Charlie, first of all, thanks for jumping on, man. Uh, always a pleasure to chat. If you could give the guys a bit of an understanding of your backstory uh, and how you got your agency or started in the first place, but also how you then scaled it up to your first 10K month. Yeah, of course, man. Well, thank you for having me, mate. First of all, I really appreciate that. So, well, my name is Charlie, as Jordan introduced me, and I basically run a company called Imperium Acquisition at the moment, um, where we help people like systemize client acquisition. Um, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the first, I don't know what you'd call it, the genesis of you know what what I've created. So, well, it go it goes back because I'm 24 now, so it goes all the way back to when I was about 17 or 18, where I was this sort of I was a pretty weird individual in the sense that it, you said this because we had a chat before this well, but Jordan said this before where he thought like, yeah, I'm going to create the next Uber. I'm going to create the next YouTube. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a billionaire essentially. And I had this sense of energy where I wanted to create something bigger than myself. And I didn't want to go down the route of a nine to five. My biggest nightmare and no word of a lie, except for maybe blood tests, but my biggest fear was the traditional, you know, um, semi-detached in the suburb somewhere, shepherd's pie for tea, nine to five, kids go to local school. There's nothing wrong with that. And I would never judge someone for living that life. But I was so inherently terrified of that and repelled by that, that I was sort of driven towards starting the agency. So that's the sort of psychological um, underpinning that, that led me to taking the actions. So the, the long the long shot of it is, is so I went to university and when I finished my A-levels, I was intent on studying psychology. At the last minute, I changed to entrepreneurship and enterprise, much to my parents' dismay, although they did support me very well. And I was I was about six months, three to six months, I can't remember exactly, into this university degree. And I spoke to my tutor, a guy called Raphael, and I was reading a book. This was the sort of pivotal moment. I was reading a book um, called and what you see is what you get by Alan Sugar. It's his autobiography. And in there, he was talking about how important sales is and stuff. And I was like, all right, billionaire, seen him on The Apprentice. He probably knows a thing or two. So I thought, well, I need to learn sales. If I want to start a business because that was why I went to university in the first place. So I went to my tutor. I said, hey, Raphael, when do we learn sales? Like, when's the sales module? Like, when do we have lectures on how to sell? He said, oh, well, we don't really do that here. And I was like, I was like oh, well, how come? He said, well, to be honest, like the lecturers, because they haven't got their own businesses, like, they don't really know how to sell so we and you know and so he just sort of started now that's when it sort of clicked in my brain and my stomach drops and i was like oh great i just wasted nine grand so the next day i literally sent over my application to drop out like i i woke up the next morning and i thought right i'm gone um and then after that basically that was a, a strange one because at university i'd kind of I'd sort of been doing a similar thing to, to what you'd be doing, right? Where you'd be going to local businesses. So I was at Plymouth Uni and I would basically, you know, on my free time, like when I wasn't um, doing lectures and stuff, I'd go out on foot to like local restaurants and stuff and try and sign them up as social media marketing client because I, you know, sort of knew a couple of things about social media at the time. And I signed like a couple of very, very low ticket clients, but I think I was doing like a grand or two a month at uni. When I dropped out, I went to do an apprenticeship. Um, and then through the apprenticeship, it was basically a cold calling apprenticeship. It was sales and marketing. I learned a lot of stuff there. But during the apprenticeship, I also built agency clients on the side in the gym niche. But bear in mind, this is what you said a while ago as well. It was in the gym niche four or five years ago now. So it was actually quite easy to get clients. And I sort of went from zero to 10K a month in that six month period. But that's that's the sort of the beginning of it. And I can go into different details at different stages, but it was basically like, dropout apprentice although i had this weird sort of period in between both of those things where i was working in um clark's customer care for clark shoes and mm. that scared me a little bit as well so that gave me more motivation but that, that's how i got started 
<laughs> oh, the old the old retail jobs. I've had plenty of them myself. Yeah, mate. Nothing. It's, nothing. It's, well, it's, it's not that bad, but it could it could be worse. But it wasn't. It's bad. not. But it's like, am I going to do this forever? Absolutely not. Uh, if it, I, I, was, I was like, you know, I thought to myself, I said, if I ever have to say good morning, Clark's customer care, Charlie Morgan speaking. <laughs> I'm help. If, I have, if I have to say that again, I thought I was going to go insane. So I had to, I had to get out of that. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, so, so you went to uni, um, which is cool. I didn't know that. And um, I mean, I went to uni as well. I, I, I actually got, ended up getting kicked out of all things. Um, but but I, I, there's many people, it's interesting because I've seen uh, quite a few people in the space have gone to uni and, and m- many of those people didn't actually follow through and, and mm. what they were doing. Did you take many lessons from university of course you realized early on that it wasn't going to be the thing that that was going to make you successful but did you take anything from university that gave you an unfair advantage when you actually started the agency that's a really good question um there's a couple of things that, that i took from it the, the first and most important lesson was how not to teach business um i think that was like a that was a good one there's a quote from abraham lincoln that says you can learn and you can learn something from any man even if it's what not to do or something like that so I, I thought I didn't have the foresight to realize that I would be teaching people business in, in the long term. But on in, in, in retrospect, when I'm building products and stuff, I do think, well, how was it taught at uni? And like, you know, I just thought that wasn't a very good idea. I think the second thing that, that I learned and realized is that it isn't particularly difficult to gain a competitive advantage over your peers and your, you know, your social competition for, for jobs and business and stuff if you've just got a little bit of a work ethic. Because, and, and not to slate anyone, but but first year of uni, which is, you know, the first few months of uni, it was my only exposure to, to that sort of culture. But I noticed that the people around me were quite lazy. They, you know, they, they'd skip lectures, even though they only had one lecture a week or something. And like a lot of them worked really hard, but I, I soon realized that like, once the essays were done, they just wanted to go away and party. Whereas I go to, there's a place in Plymouth called the Charles Seal Library or something like that. And I go there with a bag of books and read in my spare time. Everyone thought I was weird. So I learned those two things, but I wouldn't say I learned anything tip massively applicable in business from those lectures. Um, I mean, may, maybe I did, but and, and I apply it without realizing, but I think I learned more from, from books specifically when I was reading. Fine. That's interesting. Did you... Yeah. Did you feel uh, somewhat of a, even back then being in university, being kind of alone, at, or I say alone, <laughs> you were really alone in uni, uh, being introverted and so on and, and taking yourself off and reading those books on yourself, did you feel that you were destined to be successful in, in some way? Or, or yeah. were you just desperately trying to better yourself? To, to, to... I, think, I, I think that I've always had a and I've come to terms with this in the last year or two, I've always had this sort of inherent sense of narcissism and grandiosity. Um, And I think that there's a massive stigma behind thinking you're better than other people. Now, I think that in terms of value systems, I don't think I'm better than other people in terms of, you know, being good or being bad or being moral or anything like that. But I've always had the ability to take myself further and, and go above and beyond what most normal people are able to do. So when I was at uni and I was looking at people around me, I didn't look down on them because I I wasn't in a position to do that. And I wouldn't even do that these days. But I think in terms of like paradigm and mindset or wavelength, whatever you want to call it, I felt extremely isolated Mm -hmm. because, you know, one thing I did when I was at uni is a guy came, I think his name was Brett. A guy came to do um, a sort of lecture or guest speak speaking thing. And he ran a local business like in the city and he'd been on The Apprentice. And I took a camera in and I, I was sat there in this lecture hall with hundreds of people and I was sat there recording it. And after the day after I transcribed it for a YouTube channel, which I've now deleted, and everyone thought like, why is this guy recording and transcribing this stuff? And I was like, well, because in case I want to go back and rewatch it and listen to it. And like, I thought by transcribing the information, it would go into my brain more and I'd learn more from him, which it did. And that was a sort of behavior that I partook in. I didn't, I partied quite a lot during Freshers Week and then that put me off drinking and cider pretty much for, for a long time. Um, but, but generally speaking, I was just strange, mate. I was just quite, I'd isolate myself and read and stuff. So, yeah. I don't think that's strange at all. I, 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 asked oh, strange question, yeah. I asked that for a very selfish 
reason because I, it's, it's interesting because I had those feelings myself and what you just said about this sense of grandiose, I resonate with an incredible amount, like an incredible amount um, because I felt that exact same thing uh, and, and and still do to some extent. But but again, not to be mistaken by any kind of heightened sense of importance over, over, uh, over ethics or anybody in any sense that I'm better than them, but in the sense that you just know in your heart and in your frequency that you are an extremely powerful person and everything that you yeah. touch you will you will yeah i think that grandiosity is is potential in disguise it's kind of just that that deep part of you is just like because i'm i'm a firm believer that emotions or a lot of emotions are parts of us that are trying to communicate that we haven't got access to hmm. so i think that the grandiosity the narcissism the ego you know thinking like i'm gonna i'm gonna change the world i'm gonna have an impact i'm gonna do all this stuff which still exists this day like I think that that is like a, a deep part of me screaming, like, don't be average, don't be average, do more, do more. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's easy to mistake that. And, and, you know, if you're not careful, it goes to your head, then you start thinking you truly are better than people. And that happened to me. And that was like not a good place to be. And once I, you know, leveled myself out and corrected myself, I started to connect with it and say, right, why the hell do I do? I, what business do I have thinking I can be a billionaire? Because it's so it's so rare. Like, why do I think I can do that? And then I just came to terms like, do you know what? That's just. I just seem to have it in me. I just think I'm going to do it. And it's, it's extremely narcissistic to think that, but if you, if you don't let it control you, I think it's just, it's just potential in disguise. In my I, opinion. I, I think also, I, I think, but the reality of it is that it probably comes from a deep rooted place of insecurity as well. Oh, wait, like that's, uh, and and I, I know that within myself as well. And, 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 but also that, that same concept, there'll be people that are listening to this right now thinking I resonate with everything they're saying right now. And I'm glad they're saying this. But it also can manifest a lot of negativity. And it means that some people don't even fucking get started. It means that some people don't even get the work done because they believe that they're entitled to the end result before they've even had to work for it. That's and I think that's the place that we're in a lot of danger for. So, so, so you wanted to work for it and you did work for it. Can you give us a, an idea of kind of what those initial stages looked like of actually making yeah. that decision? I'm going to reach out to companies. Like, what did you do? Did you cold call them having had that apprentice? Like, what was the process? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think that just to touch on your point quickly, I think that grandiosity if it's not leveled out with humility does become pretty ugly because if you don't have the humility to realize like okay i can be this but i'm not i'm only that if i if i work so i think yeah that's that's what you have to realize um so yeah so i i put myself um so i between my my social circle and my team and stuff i i have this this place that i call the darkness <laughs> And that's basically, you can call it monk mode, you can call it nightmare mode or whatever, but I, I call it the darkness, which is where you go to a really dark place in terms of like, you try to inflict as much pain on yourself through work as possible. And through and through that infliction, you become more. And then the, as a result of that, you get what you want. So I, I took myself to the darkness, right? Which is basically where you just spend six to 12, to maybe even 18 months doing what is most painful every single day knowing that if you do that and you come out the other side and you have the balls then the market will reward you so really the work started properly well, the uni phase was sort of me i had no idea what i was doing i would go to like restaurants with like a piece of paper and be like hey do you want to work with me like here's what i offer and i'd literally have like you know the social media logo so that was a, that was a strange place but but the, the, the apprentice is where a boy became a man essentially um so First of all, I had this nine to five um, at a local marketing agency um, and my boss, Alan, I'm so grateful for him. Um, I, I completely changed my life in terms of mentoring me. But so my, my, my job was to basically call like 200 businesses, 300 businesses a day. I'd start at 9.30 and I'd finish at 5.30. And that was for the, for the business. But what I would do is I was a bit sneaky. So I would get up at about 5.30 and this was my routine basically for a whole year with a few mishaps because I wasn't perfectly you know, diligent. It's impossible to be perfectly you know, disciplined all the time. But I'd wake up at 5.30 and I'd get a gym session in and I'd be back at, at home by seven. Um, I would leave to get to the car park of my office um, and I try and get there about 8.30 or, or 7, 7.30, 8, you know, depending on how to rest at the gym. And for the first hour between, you know, 8 and 8, 9.30, whatever, I would make cold calls. And at this point, I would be cold calling gyms in the UK because I knew that a lot of them, you know, were still doing like sessions in the morning. And I also tried dabbling in, in Australian calls as well because I knew that they'd be sort of like, you know, it worked. Then I would do, so I'd do my cold calls in the morning, probably try and get like 30 of those done. because I was just like frequency dialing because I wasn't very good at it. This is the thing is I got really good at it, but at the beginning I wasn't. So mm -hmm. I could dial a lot of people because the problem with cold calling is if you have a conversation, it can take 15 minutes, right? And that's not efficient. So 
I then went from 9.30 to about 1 p.m where I would cold call for this business, right? And that was pretty unpleasant. But the good thing about that is it didn't feel anywhere near as painful because if I got rejected there, they were rejecting the business, not me. So my cold calls I found way harder because if someone said no, it was no to me. Whereas mm -hmm. if someone said no to the, to the other thing, so I created this thing called an alias, which is a cool strategy for cold calling. Well, I would call these businesses, the gyms and stuff, and I would pretend to be a guy called Joseph. Um, and I just say, hey, it's Joseph. And then if they rejected me, I was like, aha, they rejected Joseph, not me. I stopped doing that after about three months when I got through the pain. Anyway, so then I would have my lunch break from one to two. Um, from one to two, I would basically get in my car, eat my lunch or a meal do really quickly. I used to eat um, the Southern fried chicken pasta, man. It was lovely. And I would drive to a lay-by and I'd make more cold calls. Now, typically, I'd always have a sales call booked at this point from 1.15 to 2 p.m. So I'd usually take the sales call, but if I didn't, I'd do more cold calls. Then I would come back into the office um, about 2 p.m. And from 2 p.m. to 4.30 p.m., um, I would do more calls for this business or take sales calls to the business. And then here's, here's the cool thing I did. So apprentices, apprenticeships in the UK, you might be familiar with them. They have this thing called on-the-job training, which is basically where an hour a day you have to spend like doing or training, basically training yourself as an apprentice, not just working for the business. Most apprentices will spend their on-the-job training hour doing the coursework. Um, I wanted to spend it doing Consulting Accelerator by Sam Ovens. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I basically did all of my coursework in the first like three to four months of the apprenticeship. So every at the end of the day, after about three or four months, I could do Consulting Accelerator and just watch that and sort of, you know, learn the Facebook ads module, the mindset module. Then I'd come home 6 p.m. And then I'd usually do, you kind of guessed it, more cold calls. And I'd, I'd finish at like 8 p.m. And then rinse and repeat. And I'd usually take off Sundays and usually Saturday afternoons, but that was like, that was a dark time to be Charlie Morgan. <laughs> and I did that for about a year. Um, and when I finished the apprenticeship, I had like, you know, I think five, six grand a month in retainers to show for it. And I, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I sort of just dug myself out of a hole. Cause I thought, dude, if you finish this apprenticeship with nothing to show for it, you are, I know I'm not going to swear, but you're, you're in a bad place because you're going to have to go into like a nine to five. And that was me basically for a year. So that's awesome man it's 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 so it's so interesting like that you you went down that route of calling as well like because i think that that's it's the ultimate pain Absolutely. is calling it's it's, yeah. it's and it's the exact same process yeah it's but i i always think like and your results show for it because you scaled the business but and i always try and explain to people and i i, I don't know how many times i try and draw this into people and actually recording a video on this exact thing like in, in, yeah. when we jump off this Cold calling is just one of those foundational skills that just builds you as a person in so many areas that you can't even like fathom without doing it. Like it's the resilience, it's the grit, it's like the why the fuck am I doing this? And you go through the cycle of like, I deserve more than this, but then it's like, I don't deserve more because so, I'm having to do it. <laughs> like, it's, there's, there's so much more. There's so much that you take from it. And it's also like, you know, like new start agency owners who like, who are really scared of cold calling and I get it. But cold calling, like, if you then refuse to cold call and you send emails and DMs and you hide behind that and then you get a couple of meetings. Yeah, you're fucked. <laughs> you're, fucked. you're jumping on a Zoom call and you're like, it, it, your first practice of human interaction, you can't be your alias then. Like, it is you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're, you're so right. I think it's like, I, I, like, it's like I said a, a minute ago, like, I think if you do, if you cold call, you know, because I, I was dying, I think probably like 400 a day. Wow. And that was like, and because in the evening I would call American gyms because typically in the evening, if you try and contact a gym owner, in the, any gym owner between like, you know, five and 7 PM, they're just not going to answer because of how busy it is. But like, you know, I would, I kept that volume up, but eventually what starts to happen is you just become numb to it. And then sales calls feel really fucking easy. And then everything else feels easy because anything is easier than doing 400 cold calls a day. So you set this pain tolerance that is just so high. You must have been really shit on the on the phones in the first couple of I was, awful, to I, was, I was so I would stumble with <laughs> my words. I had no I like I was awful. I say four hundred a day, but eventually as I started booking meetings, the volume would go down massively. Fine. Because like you know, it's four hundred a day for you you would be a fucking multi, multi, multi millionaire if you Oh yeah, when you're good when you when you get good, yeah. But I was so I was so like bad at it for the first like it, yeah. it wasn't really until I started doing consulting accelerator and I changed my mindset and stuff, but I just was like, right, I'm just gonna call until until i die if i have to and i didn't know what to say and that this was the thing with the apprenticeship is this was like my first like it was supposed to be sales training and so i kind of had these scripts but i was i'd literally call up and be like 
Uh, hi, I've got a social media marketing agency. Uh, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you want to do Facebook ads? And, and that was literally what I'd say. And I, I just, eventually one person was like, yes, and his name was Ian. I remember signing that first client. That was amazing. But mm. yeah, after a while, like meetings and service delivery, it, it did calm down. Yeah, for sure. So, so obviously there's like a big leap between like that 10K and then like where you are today. And, and I know you, you're no longer running the, the, the gym um, agency. Are you your team coach agency owners? You got an agency that go to agency owners and existing agency owners, which is awesome. And I know one thing that I admire about you and one of the reasons I reached out initially is like your attention to detail when it comes to systemization and, and, um, and processes. Is that something that you took from Consulting Accelerator? Or is that something that just, you you learned it somewhere else or is that just like who you are because i know like your system is mad so like yeah i've got a pretty disgusting level of attention to detail to the point where like when we were building the, the new product we've got i would like everything had to be perfect and that that's a huge problem it's a huge like um what would you call it um I wouldn't call it a weakness because it's a, it's a strength as well, but mm. it's one of my main issues. My character flaws is like things for me have to be perfect. They have to be, I's have to be dotted. T's have to be crossed. And I really struggle releasing things that are imperfect. Now, the weird thing is this manifests more specifically in my product, as opposed to like my YouTube videos where I'm usually a little bit, I mean, I don't know if you've seen my Miro drawings and stuff, but they all end up looking like potatoes or something. Yeah, but, 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 but the concepts are always very in depth. Yeah, yeah, but I've always had this weird sense of, of perfectionism. Um, and that's something that it's, it's kind of like, okay, so here's an example. So, so our new product took me nine months to build. Um, and it was, it, it was the darkness for like nine months, basically. I, ironically, you caught me halfway through it. But it, it took me nine months to build. It could have taken me, I could have done it in three months, but it wouldn't have been perfect. Mm. And like, there's an argument to make where, well, that's not a good thing because I could have launched it in three months, you know, the whole MVP scenario. And then, you know, we could start making all the money and stuff. But I just I struggle with that. Whereas my business partner, Bo, balances me out. Because the problem with having really, really close attention to detail is you lack the ability to to have like, um, creative visions without huge amounts of detail. So my, my thinking process is sort of more like, you know, micro, it's more sort of, you know, in the thing. So when I was building the product, it would it, it was helpful to have Bo just sort of like, He's like, he's like, well, let's look at this from a 30,000 foot view and see where it all ties together and the vision of the company and stuff. But yeah, I've always had this weird, like obsession with detail. I suppose like detail is one of those, like almost like those privileges that you're allowed to look at once you've actually dealt with the it, mess though yourself. Yeah. Like it's something like, cause I think a lot of, I think again, like coming to, and there's a trouble with some of these, like these high level conversations sometimes, a lot of people will listen to this and will be like, oh, well, I just need to systemize and that's how I'm going to be a successful agency and I look at all the granular, going to granular level. But actually like, it's like what you do as a 100K a month business or 200K, 300K, whatever, is so different to what you do as like yeah. a 5k a month business because at 5k a month you're just throwing shit at the wall and hoping it sticks aren't you like so this, really, yeah this is the thing like so i call these action brackets where like a, a prime example of this is jeff bezos right everyone says oh jeff bezos he gets up at nine o'clock he doesn't get into work till 10 and he's blueberry pancakes for breakfast so i'm gonna do that i'm like yeah but he's a fucking billionaire and he probably has only been doing that for the last few years if you look at jeff bezos he'd be sleeping on his desk you know when he first started amazon so I think you have these action brackets where you and I, for example, uh, are, are making certain decisions, are taking certain, doing certain things, like spending. If if someone was starting a marketing agency, spent nine months building their product, I tell them they're an idiot because yes. you just can't. You haven't got the luxury of doing that. But I think there's a very big difference between systemization and optimization. And so you need to have. If you want to optimize something, you need to have something built in the first place. And almost every single time, the first version of the thing you build, no matter how much you try to optimize it, will not be optimal. <laughs> because you haven't got the luxury of hindsight and, and you haven't tested it you can only learn what to improve after testing and that's why the product we've got now is actually like the second or third iteration of the first one we had which mm -hmm. was still great but i i couldn't as much as i wanted to have huge levels of attention to detail with the first product i didn't know what to look for because i hadn't built it before and i hadn't put it through hundreds of clients to get feedback so yeah i think it's easy for people to fall into this trap it's kind of like I don't know, it's like a, it's like a really successful agency owner, like telling people, oh, like, it's just about hiring. It's about building a team. Cause this is the trap that I fell into at the beginning where like Sam Evans, for example, I watched an interview and he was like, yeah, I just realized it's all about the people. So I would like in the really early days, I was like, I need to hire great people, but if you haven't got a great company, you can't get great people. 
Mm -hmm. And so the only way to get a great company is by being great yourself. But if you're stuck in this binary paradox of thinking you need great people to make a great company. So it's, it's, it's really easy to lose sight of this. And I think this happens with all sorts of people, but it's, it's hard to have the prudence to differentiate between actions that make sense at your level and make sense at a different level. I agree. Agreed. I think the most important thing for like people starting off is they just like, if they're not obsessing over details at all, like it's like, and I think it's that they do not, and not do not follow the advice of people that are already in, like that are already ahead. But like, if you're if you're just starting an agency, like you need to be following in the footsteps of people that are like just a couple of steps ahead of you. And like, it's okay. You can like someone like myself. I can teach people how to start an agency and do that. But because I have so many people around me who are at that 10k point, like I got so many people, like all these people, like this sea of people that are just just getting through it. So like, you got this, you got this web of information that makes it way makes its way up to the top. But I think so many people like, oh, like I want to be a millionaire at some point their life so they just take advice from millionaires whereas millionaires are so detached from the level of just like getting started with your agency so i think for anyone watching this like and you should definitely go check out charlie's channel there's a lot of information that'll be very useful to you if you're a new start agency owner like try not to adopt too much the systemization and shit right just get the work done do what we did right if there's one thing you're going to take from this it's well, like it's the like, taking the calls you know it's like the only piece of advice you need at the beginning is volume of outreach Mm -hmm. so that's that's it you just if you just nail volume of outreach if you just do lots and lots of outreach ideally cold calling so that you, you build a thick skin and you build some communication and persuasive skills that's all you need to do because then because you know i see people who are like making like one grand a month they're like oh i want to build all these systems i'm like dude you can't systemize what doesn't work or i see someone doing five grand a month oh, i want to hire a sales rep it's like, well, how many meetings have you booked this month? Or like five? Like, how are you going to have a full-time rep doing five meetings? Oh, yeah, but he'll do the outbound calls. All right, have you got a process for outbound calling? Well, no. It's like, so you have to be really careful not to not to fall prey to this disconnect between, you know, between what is right to do and, and what is right to do at a higher level. Yeah. So yeah. it's a problem. Awesome. All right, man, I know you've got a team meeting. So um, we'll jump on another one of these calls in the, in the near future. I, I think love that, mate. To, I to love it talk some more shit we can get down into uh, now we've got a nice seas out of the way we can get down into the nitty gritty and, and jump on some process and stuff so uh, Bob's, mate. nice it. guys go check out charlie i'll put a link in the description um and yeah i'll chat to you all in a bit cheers brother cheers guys